Fushigi Maho Fun Fun Pharmacy, or Mysterious Magic Fun Fun Pharmacy, is a 1998 TV anime series directed by Yukio Kaizawa and produced at anime production studio Toei. This series centers on Popuri, though her real name is Kaori Nishino, but she really likes her nickname, at least that's how she always introduces herself to anyone who asks, and over the course of the series' 44 11-minute episodes and 4 22-minute episodes, plenty of people ask. Anyway, it's about Popuri, who I shall from now on simply refer to as Pot, as she moves into and explores a new town, hangs out with the residents, and most importantly, meets a witch whose hairstyle is 80% Bride of Frankenstein, and who inspires Pot to want to be a witch herself. Much of the show is dedicated to Pot's misadventures with learning to magic good. Given that, one may be tempted to label this series as a magical girl show or a legacy magical girl show, and indeed, the commenter who recommended this show for this viewer's choice video did so specifically because it's part of the foundation of the Precure franchise, due to some recurring staff and being done at the same animation studio. Thanks for this, by the way, Mikagu. We'll get to the Precure thing in a bit, but as for whether this is a Magical Girl series, well, I, I mean, obviously it is. Granted, despite the numerous Precure seasons under my belt, I'm not actually yet well-versed enough in Magical Girl history to be able to tell exactly where this series falls in that legacy, but I do know enough to recognize some key differences that give the show its own unique identity, at least in comparison to more modern stuff, so we've got some stuff to talk about. I guess let's start with this show's brand of magic, and how that's one way this show differs from modern magical girl fare. What are the aesthetic and narrative elements that come to mind when you think of magical girls today? You've got your transformation sequences, and the cute outfits, and the magic itself can really be a lot of things, from straight up like laser attacks to augmenting physical abilities, whatever the fuck. Narratively, magic can be in service of monster of the week brawls or be the system through which a story unfolds like a bad guy's plan or a series of MacGuffins. It's also a great way to sell toys. Magic is a lot of things, but there's always a tangible, visceral element to it. It's a thing that a character does, an action that they perform, and none of that is at all the case in Fushigi Maho Fun Fun Pharmacy. Magic in this series is less a tool and more a collection of unseen elements in the world. It's much more spiritual in nature emphasizing a connectedness with the surrounding world rather than, you know, I'm a firing my laser! <laughs> For Pot, magic manifests through the use of this, uh, the, well, okay, I guess this is one element that survived right into Precure, an out-of-place looking plastic doohickey that you can buy now for only $9.99. But anyway, magic only manifests for Pot not as some fighting power, but through spirits that have only relatively minor effects on the world around her, from making wind to brightening things up and occasionally some more extreme stuff. What's important here is that Pot doesn't control these spirits to fight anything or otherwise do her bidding. Rather, she just talks to them and asks them for their help. She tries to be their friend, even going so far as to give them names. We've got Pinch, Shibu, Grim, Lalu, and... Uh, uh, Rick. And I'm, I'm sorry, but the present state of internet culture requires me to regurgitate the following meme, so please bear with me. <clears throat> I'm Magic Rick. Wubba lubba dooba dee doo. I've got a little riddle for you. If you want to know whether to watch this show, I'm here to tell you the answer is. I'm not telling you that. We're not here for easy answers like that. Give me a break. What was I saying? Right, uh, magic here is just a part of the world, a cool thing that exists and is connected to everything. It's not there to fight with, it's just there. And Pot sometimes interacts with it for various pleasant purposes, such as having fun or personally growing. And, you know, though it may not seem like it, Pot does grow quite a bit throughout the series. She starts off as a fun, energetic gal who may be in a bit over her head, she dreams big and is impulsive, 
often diving straight into unfamiliar situations with no idea what she's doing, often causing things to get magically out of hand. She makes a lot of mistakes, but what's cool about her is that she's free-spirited and independent, so she's always determined to fix her mistakes on her own and learn from them. At the start of the series, she struggles to communicate and cooperate with the magic spirits she summons, but by the end, she's working in harmony with them, almost without a thought, like it's second nature to her. She becomes more disciplined and thoughtful, and makes friends with many of the townsfolk and magic folk along the way. Speaking of, aside from Pot's gradual growth, the show doesn't really have a story, no overarching narrative or anything like that. Aside from the light focus on Pot and her slow growth, the show is also broadly about the town she's found herself in, about the people who live there. Often Pot is just the connective tissue between a bunch of isolated stories about various townsfolk, and it's all the little stories about the various characters that populate this town that sell the setting as a living, breathing place. Like there's these two youngsters who are clearly crushing on one another but won't admit it, with the girl deliberately adopting a work schedule that aligns with her crushes so she gets to see him every time he's out. And then there's this husband and wife who run a store together, and the husband is just absolutely worthless. He's running the business into the ground and deflects all blame, just completely awful. The wife leaves him and I was 100% behind her. Honestly, she should have just stayed gone. I was sad when she got back with him. He doesn't deserve her. She deserves so much better. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, right, uh, the little stories of the townsfolk comprise just some of this series' vignettes, which, by the way, are this series' primary mode of storytelling. Given that all the episodes are about 11 minutes long, no single episode has much time to tell anything other than a quick, simple story, so that's what they do. Every episode is just a pleasant little isolated story about whatever. About someone in a town, about something Pot did one day, or about something weird that happened. These vignettes can either just be a pleasant little distraction or provide some brief insight into the town's life or the problems faced by children like Pot. Like, maybe in one episode, Pot just meets it's a cute mermaid, and that's that, and that's fun and fine. Maybe in another episode, she's sucked into a book with another witch, and they grow just a little bit closer, and that's that, and that's fine and fun. But maybe another episode is about her messing with time magic, and things go crazy because all Pot wanted was to meet her dad because she never sees him because of work, because Japanese work culture is so terrible that it keeps families apart, and children are forced to conclude that the only logical and sensible way to be with their family is fucking time travel. But anyway this series, told as a bunch of little vignettes, paints a picture of a pleasant little town and an energetic little girl growing up within it. There's nothing in the way of world-ending stakes or anything like that. It's just a fun little series of tales about a little girl growing up just a little. I would advise anyone interested, though, to not do what I did and watch this all at once because this show, given its vignette format, is really meant to be taken in one piece at a time. Watch too much of it at once and it'll all start to blend together into a technicolor blur. Under normal circumstances that would be the end of the video, but I'm going to tack on an extra bit at the end here to try to address this tenuous pre-cure connection because apparently that's all I'm known for. A quick disclaimer, this is actually a really rushed video for me. From the time of watching the show to upload date should be about six days, so the research that went into this is pretty uh, snappy and bare bones, but this is what my schedule allowed for so sorry about that. Anyway, I went and looked up the staff list of this show on ANN and examined the roles of Fushigi's key and other staff on other anime projects to see if there were any connections with Precure or other interesting projects. And here's what I found based on that brief search. Series director Yukio Kaizawa wouldn't go on to dip his toes into the Precure pond for a good long while. His first credited contribution to Precure is the first CG segment of the Go Princess Precure movie. He would then go on to be series director for Kira Kira Precure a la mode. As for how his particular style may have influenced that season, I suppose we'll just have to wait and see. I should note that just because he's not credited on ANN doesn't mean he definitely didn't have any influence over the series before then. After all, he's been working at Toei all this time, just there's a lack of readily available information that would make any earlier influence easier to suss out. Other notable works include directing some Digimon series and co-directing Bloody Zatch Bell. Okay, that's definitely a thing. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, the man credited for series composition for one of Kaizawa's Digimon series, Tamers, was also the head writer for Fushigi Maho. This man's name is Chiaki Konaka. 
And while he isn't credited for any Precure related thing, a post on Sakuga Boru noted that the two were known collaborators, so take from that what you will. Aside from Fushigi, Konaka is also known for writing fucking serial experiments lane and technolized damn. This guy's got cred. Among the credited episode directors, the only Precure connection I found was Takuya Igarashi, who directed the eighth episode of the original Precure season. And supposedly, that's a pretty fondly remembered episode, so good on him. We've got more connections among animation directors, though. Katsumi Tamegai, Ken Ueno, Michiaki Sugimoto, and Naoki Miyahara have all since contributed to Precure. In particular, Tamegai was on board with Precure from the start, having been an animation director for four episodes on the original series, and has continued to work on Precure up through Hugto. Ueno, as well, while not on board from the start, has worked on Precure since Sweet as an animation director. Between all that, we can say without a shadow of a doubt that some of the creative staff from Fushiki Maho work on and have continued to work on Precure. To what degree the production of Fushigi influenced Precure, I cannot say for certain, neither on a narrative or real-world level, though again, the inclusion of the plastic doohickeys does make me rather suspicious. However, I do think it's safe to say that the series are a part of each other's respective legacies. If anyone wants to draw any more conclusions from that, or indeed if anyone has any more information regarding connections between the two series, I invite you to share in the comments. And I think that'll do it for me this time. Thanks for sitting through my ramble about a children's magical cartoon show. This has been a viewer's choice video. See the description for details on that. Shout out to Mikog U for making this recommendation. And real quick, I forgot to shout out the recommender of Flip Flappers in that video. So thanks for that, your local Fudanchi. Look forward to my yearly roundup video. It might be a little different this time. Until then, be gay, do crimes. Why do I keep saying that?